Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome Professor Sunitra Gupta, who is Professor of Theoretical Epidemiology from the University of Oxford. She will give us her 15 to 20 minutes talk and then we can interrogate her after that. So I'll hand over to Sunitra. Okay, so th thank you again for asking me to come and speak on um, the epidemiology of the, this particular um, pandemic. Um, now, traditionally, epidemiologists sort of, um, you know, the traditional role used to be one of essentially gathering and presenting data. Um, but uh, in the last uh, sort of half century or so, and uh, certainly uh, starting in the 70s and 80s, the efforts of um, uh, Robert May, who has actually recently passed away, and Roy Anderson, um, infectious diseases, uh, the application of ecological models to infectious diseases has become a very central part of the whole process of epidemiology. So it's not just um, a gathering and statistical sort of analysis of the data, but trying to find and understand some of the mechanistic elements that the coming up with mechanistic um, hypotheses really about how a disease is transmitting and what that says um, in turn about the fundamental biological processes that are involved. So that's been uh, something that's been a growing field and I've been privileged to be part of that. Um, so I'm not going to show you a whole load of data because that would take up an awful lot of time and of course you uh, have access and probably are acutely aware of, of the global situation. Um, so I'll just start with, um, nonetheless, with some data. I'll start with um, the picture as it stands in this country um, of deaths associated with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV uh, coronavirus 2, as we call the infectious agents itself. And um, it's, um, I call it, I use the word associated um, for a reason. It's, uh, uh, at least to me, I'm not entirely sure exactly which fraction of these are deaths that are actually caused by the virus and those which happen to be, uh, occur with the virus. And, and I think both, you know, the media and uh, other channels have been very careful to, to be, to make that distinction or, or to be, um, you know, aware or, or cognizant that, those are two different things. Nonetheless, either way, they are representative that one cannot argue with the fact of death and deaths that occur with obvious coronavirus indications or those that are merely associated with it, uh, nonetheless, give you a picture of what is really, what's going on. And I say um, this and the reason why I haven't shown cases, which often comes up when you Google what's going on, um, is because cases are very much contingent. The measurement of cases uh, is almost entirely dependent on the level of surveillance and particularly what fraction, what particular population is being, being surveyed. So um, I will not really, I, I don't think one can uh, use cases to gain an understanding of the true picture. But deaths, we cannot argue with. And with deaths, we have seen them rising um, rapidly and indeed, and then peaking um, sort of early April and, and they have started to come down. So that's the, the graph you see here. These are data from um, the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine in Oxford and an update on the 12th of May. And what you can see is, um, both the NHS England data and the Office of National Statistics data, and they both show the same sort of trend. Um, now, coronavirus, of course, I actually can't see the rest of my screen, but perhaps you can see this little diagram from the WHO outlining that disease with coronavirus is not always severe and or um, within severe, there's severe, and then there's really severe as in critical. Um, but disease can be moderate and mild, uh, 
So what this, these graphs are tracking is the eventuality of um, death from any of these conditions. And so, as I said, on, on the left-hand side, you see the actual cases and their, their dynamic with time. And on the right-hand side is the cumulative number of cases, which is what seems, uh, which is often what's reported um, in the press or as a sort of, sort of sound bite of uh, what's happening. And there again, you see some discrepancies between the NHS, the ONS and Public Health England. But you know, overall, you, you, there's a trend of a growth uh, reaching now, a sort of, um, well, a slower growth tending towards a plateau. So that's the, the picture. But what, what can we contribute? Why am I, why did I start by saying I'm going to go beyond that and um, talk about how we can use theoretical methods, mathematical models to understand this process? Um, well, of course, uh, I, I don't need to introduce that as it won't, won't come as a complete surprise to you that that is where I'm going because, of course, in this pandemic, um, mathematical models have been um, very much a feature, uh, a very strong part of the whole, apparently, of, of the decision making. So why do we use mathematical models at all in understanding epidemiology? Well, I'll start first of all, I'll start with a little illustration, which I hope will give you a sense of why mathematical models are important, and then go on to explain specifically how they might be used to make sense of what's going on right now. So I'll start off by reminding you, I think uh, is probably the right word for most of the audience, um, that pathogens have different life history strategies. The measles virus um, is a sort of hit and run virus which comes in, um, causes a big peak in viral load, viremia, and then you get the clinical symptoms, the rash, uh, the immune system kicks in, it, it's resolved, the viral RNA declines quickly over a period of weeks, and um, we become immune to the virus. But in the meantime, while we're infectious, or in, uh, while we have the high viremia, um, we manage typically to, in the absence of vaccination, to, to pass it on to somebody else, and so the cycle continues. By contrast, if you look at a disease like HIV, uh, when you're infected with HIV, it's there to stay, and in the absence of antiretroviral theory, what this picture shows is that in uh, a typical, uh, the typical time course of infection was one where you get an early spike and then a long period where it uh, remains at a sort of stable set point and in the absence of therapy, um, because of the loss of CD4 T cells, you would get um, eventually um, uh, a very unpleasant outcome of AIDS. Um, so we have here two very different life history strategies. And what that justifies then is a way of representing how these viruses spread in the population using mathematical models um, that stratify the population according to their relationship with the virus. So in the case of the measles virus, you would uh, rightfully be able to um, describe the population as either being susceptible, infected or recovered, and in the case of measles, definitely immune to further infection. So measles virus, um, the way you can capture its um, dynamics in a population is by stratifying it into those who are susceptible, infected and recovered. Um, while with HIV, you only need to consider those who are susceptible and those who are infected. So having created this kind of schematic to try and understand how to link essentially the life history of the virus with its population dynamics, what you then do is write down a set of equations and then solve those equations using numerical methods and um, with the assistance of a computer. And if you do that, you find with the measles virus that the model shows uh, if you start off with a one single infected individual, you will get this big spike, first epidemic in a naive population, followed then by a period where it seem, appears to be quiet, uh, 
but it's really gathering fuel again in the sense that susceptible people are coming into the population. Then you see um, another epidemic and then successively smaller epidemics. And you see this sort of pattern of um, oscillations which do die out eventually, but can be sustained by um, external forces. While, while with HIV, you see this sort of gradual growth reaching, tending towards a plateau. And if you look at the population dynamics of these um, diseases, uh, measles in England and Wales shown here in the pre-vaccine era, you can see this sort of um, cyclical behavior, which is at the heart of which you do have this fundamental kind of oscillatory pattern that's exhibited by the model. And uh, by contrast with HIV, this is prevalence of HIV in pregnant women in South Africa, and you can see that has a completely different dynamic. And so this gives us some confidence that this kind of uh, way of conceptualizing how a virus spreads in a population by using compartmental models that reflect its fundamental life history strategy is actually a sensible way to go. So how do we then um, use that, that um, knowledge to try and um, make sense of what's happening with SARS-CoV-2, uh, with COVID-19? Well, uh, I think we all agree among scientists that COVID-19 is best captured by one of these SIR type frameworks. And so um, it can be represented in um, this format within this framework where you have people who are either susceptible, infected or recovered. And so you have these compartments and you have some plumbing that takes you from being susceptible to being infected. And that happens at a rate that is proportional to the, the risk of infection, um, which we call lambda, the per capita risk of infection. And then from the infected compartment, you recover at a rate which is um, obviously related to how long the, the virus um, stays in your body. And then you recover and whether or not you're immune um, for a long period of time is a matter of still um, of debate, if you like, um, or awaiting further confirmation. But for the moment, just in this period of time that we're looking at, we can assume that these people are no longer available for infection. So you can write down a set of equations and what you, um, again, get when you look at, if you solve the set of equations, is you find that the if you start off with a 100% of the population being susceptible. So here on the x-axis is the proportion susceptible. And in the blue, you see the proportion susceptible declining as the epidemic um, moves through the population. You see the proportion infected increasing, and you'll see that at first it doesn't increase that rapidly, and then it goes through this period of really um, rapid exponential growth. But then at some point it turns over and starts to decline. And in this simple model, that's because um, it's depleted its resource, which, is, which are the susceptible, susceptibles in the population. And the green line tells you who's recovered. And in this particular realization, you can see it goes up very quickly and then plateaus at a certain point. Um, you will have heard a lot, and that's why I put this equation up, about the fundamental transmission potential R0 of the pathogen. And that is, can be derived from these equations by recognizing that the risk of infection is related to the numbers infectious through a jumble of parameters related to transmission, which I've captured with this big letter B. And when you do the maths, you can see quite easily that the epidemic cannot take off at all unless this big B divided by the rate at which you lose infectiousness is greater than one. And so that tells you uh, two things. One, whether it can take off at all or not. And also once, if it is in excess of one, it will, because the physical interpretation of this quantity is the number of secondary infections generated by a primary infection. If it's over one, it means it can take off. 
and the precise measure of it gives you a sense of its fundamental transmission potential. And then as soon as it starts to take off, this R starts to decline, which is why now people are talking about values of R less than one, which is because it is no longer increasing in the population. So now, from these sorts of models, we want to now try and come up with a, a sense of which of these particular scenarios um, that you can generate with these models actually tells us what's happening with the current um, pandemic. So I'm again just going to focus on what's happening in this country. But um, what you need to think about, so the data, as I mentioned earlier, have to do with the deaths, the, the rate at which deaths are accruing and also um, how they're turning over. So if we just for the moment focus on cumulative mortality, um, how do we infer that from this model? Well, what we need to do is make up our minds about what um, fraction of people who are being infected are actually submitting to this fate. And we can think of that fraction as the infection fatality rate. In other words, the risk of dying if you are infected. And so we can run this model and say that a fraction of people who are infected are going to die and very easily from that assumption calculate how mortality will rise, increase through time. And I've put real dates here because um, it's worth thinking about how you would actually use these models to relate to what we observe. And if you um, run this model for a very high infection um, fatality rate, you can get um, the sort of behavior you recover for the same, very similar sort of behavior to if you have a low infection fatality rate, you can get a very quick rise in mortality reaching very high levels up to, you know, close to um, 500,000 as was, has been mentioned in previous reports. However, if you run it for, a, not surprisingly, a smaller uh, infection fatality rate, you, you can get for a very similar model, uh, the s similar R0, a much lower cumulative mortality. So which of these actually fits the data? And the truth is, if you consider the data up to the point of lockdown, uh, beyond which you could argue that this model no longer applies because lots of other things have come into the mix, they all do. So you can have a range of infection fatality rates, and that's what's shown here with the different colors, starting from a very low infection fatality rate of one in 10,000, 2.6 or closer to, to um, 1%. And you can see that they, they all fit the data, but they have very different predictions. They produce very different uh, predictions for the eventual number of people who will succumb to this disease. However, these, for each of these, so then you might say, well, great, how am I supposed to tell what's actually going to, what's actually happening then? But fortunately, for each of these different outcomes, there is linked to each of these a something that we can measure, which is the proportion that are immune um, at, in this case, I'm showing on the 19th of March. For each of these outcomes, you have a particular value for the proportion immune at that date. And that is also linked very closely, intrinsically tied to the date at which the epidemic was actually introduced. So in other words, there are sort of two extreme possibilities. One, that the epidemic's only just taking off, but has a very high case fatality rate. That's this blue bar um, here. And then at the other extreme, it may be that the epidemic is not at all um, uh, virulent, that is to say it has a very low infection fatality rate, but that, um, yeah, but that would mean that it must have started earlier, already peaked, and therefore most people will already be immune to that epidemic. Well, how do we then find out which of these is true? 
Well, clearly, the only way we can is by determining the level of exposure. Sorry. The hazards. So by determining the level of exposure, um, we can. So going back to the previous slide, as I said, there is this, the difference between these outcomes is reflected in the proportion who've already been exposed. As you can, not surprisingly, if a large fraction have already been exposed, that indicates the infection fatality rate is low. Whereas if um, only a small fraction have been ex exposed so far, that means that this is the, the better, the, the more likely model. So the way to uh, look at that, uh, to determine that, is to um, actually do the serological surveys that tell you either about, well, ideally about the level of exposure in the population, but also some information can also be gained by looking at the infection prevalence. And I don't really have time to go in detail um, to go into any of these in detail, but just to say one can look at infection prevalence by um, looking for the virus itself in people. And this is a study that's just come out um, from a group in Harvard, and they've been looking in New York, and you can see that the infection prevalence levels um, are really quite high um, in many of the different um, boroughs of New York City. But a even more reliable indicator of who's been exposed is um, can be obtained by looking at antibodies in people's um, sera to see if they as a marker of having had the exposure um, having had the infection and that's something we and others have been doing by developing reliable tests for that and this is just some preliminary data that we obtained from uh, um, through a very fortunate collaboration with the, the Scottish um, blood, National Blood Transfusion Service. Um, just So these are the data that will tell us where we're at, that will allow us to discriminate between those um, different scenarios. However, also crucial in figuring out what's to happen next is uh, something that we have been getting data on, which is that vulnerability is not distributed evenly across the population. So we've been, um, it's been abundantly clear for a very long time that being that vulnerable people, either the elderly or people with comorbidities, are those who are dying from the virus. So this raises two questions. One is, first of all, whether some people are actually super resistant to the infection in which case even using those antibody tests won't give us a full picture of who is fully resistant to infection. And the other point is that if these vulnerable sections of the population are actually, um, don't interact as fully with the, the general less vulnerable population, then what we're observing now by way of deaths in that population may be considerably lagged behind what uh, when the epidemic actually happened so um, at the risk i've already um, clearly um, overrun my time but i just wanted to say as data accumulate if there's one point i want you to take away from what i've said as data accumulate we will be able to use a scale just as boris johnson did the other day to discriminate between these various different possibilities which are all equally um, able to explain the data up till when we went into lockdown. Everything was possible, but we need to have this sort of sliding scale, which as data come in, tell us whether um, something that was possible becomes plausible and perhaps even um, a sense to being probable whereas other scenarios which were also possible start to shift towards being unlikely. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm sorry I've run over a little bit, but I hope I've given you a flavour for how we can use these very simple models to gain an insight into what's happening in this uh, pandemic and um, hopefully make 
sensible decisions about how, where to go from here. Thank Fantastic. You. Many thanks, Sunitra. Um, can you put the screen back? Yeah. So people can, can see yeah, you. There we go. Right. Double. Okay. So uh, thank you to, uh, for that overview of um, how things work. Um, that I've had a number of questions. Um, so the R value, we've, as you say, we've all heard a lot about the R value and it's clearly uh, a very critical element of the whole uh, epidemic. So how do you measure the R value? How good is the measurement? It's very difficult to measure the R value um, in the sense that, it, as I said, the R value is, if you construct an expression for it, it will include various um, elements that influence the transmission of the pathogen. Um, so you have to be sure, first of all, that you've constructed that expression correctly, which is very, very difficult. And then you have to be measured, uh, in poor, sure that you've measured every element of everything that you've put into that mix correctly. And it's, um, it's really very, very tricky. However, you can, there are surrogate, surrogates, which is obviously what we've been relying upon to, to obtain these measures. And that has to do with the rate of growth of the epidemic in its early stages and also its decline. So in some ways, the R value is simply telling you whether it's on its way up or on its way down. But um, it is actually very difficult to measure it from its constituent parameters. So, so how reassured should we be when the government say uh, we can relax certain uh, guidelines, um, but uh, if the R value starts to go up, uh, we'll have to bring things back in again. Is there going to be a significant delay before it becomes clear that the R value is really changing? Uh, well, the R value at the moment is simply a reflection of the fact that the cases, that the infection is going down, that the epidemic is um, declining. I mean, the numbers infected, the numbers dying um, are declining. So it, stand, it goes without saying that if we haven't built up enough immunity to this pathogen, that the R value, um, that it will be difficult to maintain that status. But what has not been perhaps properly highlighted is that the major component of this R value actually is the proportion immune. So the reason we have an expression R naught is because that tells you about the fundamental transmission potential of the pathogen when nobody is immune. So at the moment we have an R and it's going down, which is fantastic. But whether it's going down because many of us are immune or because the measures that were put in place have been enough to throttle the pathogen is not something I think we have the means to distinguish. Okay, so another key parameter that was on your graphs was the infection fatality rate. And presumably that, uh, to calculate that, you need an accurate uh, denominator of how many people have been infected? Yes, precisely. And so that's precisely why we need to find out how many people have been infected or exposed, um, as you call it. Um, and so the best we can do in that regard is to roll out these um, antibody tests, which many of us have been working on. And now I'm pleased to say we have sort of battery of reliable tests and um, ideally one would of course use at least two to, to get them, uh, to have some confidence in what we were measuring. And, and that's what we collectively, I think, in the UK are, are trying to do. Um, that's crucial. But then as, as I also briefly mentioned, there might be a, a group of people who are so resistant to infection that they don't even get to the stage where they get make antibodies. So. Um, that will be interesting to see. Will I guess it will come out eventually in the wash? Yes. So um, that's the best last, we can do. Then last we week, do um, right Richard Pedder, um, mm -hmm. who you may know, um, mm -hmm. gave us a talk on antibody detection, um, mm -hmm. which I think I, I, I found um, 
somewhat depressing because the main message that he seemed to get across was that the tests we have, and they may be okay at picking up levels in patients who are seriously ill in hospital, um, but he did show some data that patients who are um, mildly ill or asymptomatic but happen to have been diagnosed with COVID um, make very low levels of antibody um, well, in our experience, which is still limited, we have found pretty um, good levels, some asymptomatic patients to show very reliable markers of, of exposure through through their antibody levels. So, okay, uh, but you know, it's still we're still going through that process of cross validation and, and firming up all of that. But I think we're we're all feeling fairly comfortable with what we have at our disposal now. The question okay. is, are these, what about the people who get, don't even get infected, whose innate immune systems deal with this? And, you know, okay. if we leave them out, then we might get a different picture. But it's a, re a reassuring message to hear that, that there are assays being developed that, that perhaps are, uh, can pick up antibodies in patients who aren't severely ill. Um, so uh, I think you partially answered this, but, but somebody's asked, how does social distancing affect all your calculations? And I, I, um, how does social... Well, it, it affects that jumble of parameters that you um, put into to, um, your calculation of, of R. Um, but so far, what we've done is, is simply... Well, that, that simple model just gives you a framework for tethering ideas of um, where we're at. I mean, it, it gives you the, the bigger picture of discriminating between two very different scenarios. One, where the epidemic is only just taking off, in which case it's very important to understand exactly what social distancing is doing. And the other alternative, where it's actually already spread through largely. And so social distancing will have, um, you know, had some impact on the, the downward slope. Um, but I mean, I think what's crucial here is that what we need to know is what that model highlights are the two important things are the infection fatality rate and how many people are already immune. And those two things are, would remain the important things to measure, whether or not you include social distancing or any other elaboration on that basic framework. Okay, um, so your slide showed these two possible, uh, if you like, extreme interpretations that would fit the data. Um, so can I put you on the spot and ask you, you know, you're very close to this data, what is your interpretation? Which is the more likely explanation? Um, I will stick my neck out right now because <laughs> I'm very concerned about um, the current situation and its effects on um, other vulnerable sections of our society. I will stick my neck out and say, I think it is uh, much more plausible that the virus entered uh, the UK much earlier than uh, is currently assumed and that it had spread through the population um, to, it, that, that there had been a substantial degree of spread through the general population uh, by the time we instituted lockdown. Okay, so uh, uh, apart from the implication then that perhaps the lockdown was a little bit after the event as it were, um, the, the good news from that interpretation is that uh, it, it is safer than it might have been to release the lockdown because the virus has already been around for a bit. Is that yeah, well, and I think you know, I mean, the, the whole point of this exercise was to say, let's find out. And I think we are trying, starting to find out. And I completely agree that it, it, it's a waste of time to talk about whether we needed the lockdown or not. The point is, we are where we, where we are. And I'm sure there were good reasons to lockdown, which are outside anyway of just what the epidemic might do. Um, and but right now we are where we are and we need to find a way out and if we can go out there and measure what proportion of the population is immune um, I think that will help us get out of this situation right 
Um, so I've been asked a very pointed question here. Uh, you, you've got your own data in your own model. Um, does that differ significantly from the Imperial College model, which we've heard a lot about? Uh, or is the essential structure of the model the same and the data the same? And do you come to the same conclusions or are they radically different from each other? No, they're not at all radically different from each other. They are fundamentally um, the same model. Um, so the only thing we disagree on is the infection fatality rate, which um, the Imperial model and several others um, that have been published assume to be in the ballpark 1%. And um, we disagree not at the level of saying, no, it can't possibly be 1%, although I'm coming to that conclusion, but that, it's, um, that we should consider a range of possibilities there rather than um, holding on to that 1% with our dear lives. Okay, um, I think you've already touched on this, but somebody is asking, uh, do, your, do your models allow you to, to look retrospectively and work out when it all began? Yes. Uh, and um, when did it begin? <laughs> yeah, so, so if, you can, if you can figure out what proportion of people were immune in uh, March, let's say, or are immune now, you, you can, that shuts off many of the other possibilities. So if a lot of people were immune uh, by the end of March, then you'd have to, it would have have to arrived, stands to reason, a lot earlier. So that's the key thing. If we can figure out how many people were already exposed by then, then we expand the denominator, or that has serious consequences for the denominator in the infection fatality rate, and um, means that it arrived earlier. So it would have to have arrived earlier in order to um, make, to, to, to have a low infection fatality rate. But if it arrived earlier, Conversely, if it had ar has arrived, if we can show it arrived earlier, then it's very unlikely that it has a high case fatality rate, I mean, infection fatality rate, sorry. So, so presumably there are serum collections around taken right across January, February, March, that you could do that kind of serum survey. Yes, that's right. And of course, people are also looking at um, presentation with symptoms, which are specific, COVID specific, to try and get some sort of sense of whether there was um, a substantial spread of, of the virus prior okay. to when we started detecting, detecting the deaths. The deaths lag behind by two to three weeks. So um, I, I'm, I'm getting messages to start winding up, but there are some interesting yeah. questions here. Um, I, I don't know this one. Would you advocate that Sweden's approach was better? I can't... So, and Sweden didn't go into lockdown, I think. Is that right? Um, uh, what, what I, 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 I fully, um, yes, I fully sympathise with their approach. Yeah. And is the epidemic taking the same shape in, in, in all these different countries? Because we're, we're forever being asked to compare how we're doing versus everyone else. But is there any evidence that it's behaving well, it's differently? It's quite unfortunate that the rhetoric surrounding that is one of, you know, sort of like a Eurovision song contest. Oh, but, it, but yes, if you, if you looked at it more rationally, I would say that, you know, rather reassuringly, the epidemics in various different countries do sort of conform to the SIR model. Again, underscoring that that's all you need to obtain enough of an understanding that can actually guide public policy rather than trying to make very, very specific predictions about okay. what's going to And I, I will make this the very last question, um, but it's a question we'd love to know the answer to. So if someone is asking, uh, when will, will we be allowed to go back to indoor activities that involve multiple people, which more or less is sort of, when can we go back to what life was like before COVID? Um, in, in the modeling that you've done, can you predict uh, when you will have sufficient data to be able to advise that that is a safe thing to do? Well, um, I think that uh, tragically, <laughs> I'm sorry to say that, it, that those decisions are completely beyond you know, my 
uh, even if I predicted tomorrow that, if I said tomorrow that my data indicates that we can go back to our normal lives today or actually that a month ago, um, that's still not something that will necessarily feed through and be implemented. So I can't tell you um, when we would be able to resume our normal lives. I would just draw attention to the fact also that we have now more data on who actually dies of the disease or of the infection. And I think that's something that we need to take into consideration. It would be good if people took into cons consideration the powers that be in um, deciding as and when we return to our normal lives. And as a final point, of course, our normal lives are, were, are lovely and wonderful, and as are some of our lockdown lives for those who are fortunate enough to be sequestered with their family uh, and whatnot, and have gardens and sunshine. But we must always, in all of this, please remember just how unfortunate of consequence lockdown is having on many very vulnerable people around the planet. Can I thank you very much indeed for, for taking uh, a non-mathematical audience, I suspect, um, through some difficult concepts uh, so clearly and uh, for dealing with all the questions that have arisen. I'll say thank you very much for attending. We, we got over the 200 mark, um, so uh, clearly still a lot of interest. Uh, and thank you again to Sunitra for such an excellent talk. Well, and thank you very much for inviting me. See many of you next Pleasure. year. Okay. Right. Bye. Bye-bye.